everyone. My name is Tiago Amparo. I'm a law professor at Sao Paulo Law School at Getúlio Vargas Foundation, and I'm also a coordinator of the Center of Racial Justice and Law. I'm here with my colleague, Professor Alexandra Anderhoff from the University of Copenhagen. Since starting her career as a lawyer in 2006, Alexandra has worked in various important offices in Europe. In 2019, started heading towards her work in education, which later on led her to become a scholar in schools like Cornell Law School and most, recent, most recently at the University of Copenhagen. She's also a founder and director of the Copenhagen Legal Tech Lab at the University of Copenhagen, an interdisciplinary center for law technology. Professor Alexander's research focuses on questions of corporate law, corporate legal governance, capital markets, law and technology from an um, interdisciplinary and comparative perspective. Her main research interest lies in integration of legal, economic and technological analysis with a particular emphasis on more sustainable, inclusive, democratic and fair markets. Professor Alexandre is here at FGV to teach a course, a short course, as part of the Sao Paulo Law School Global Law Program. This program, the Global Law Program, is open to uh, various students, undergraduate students from the third year, from an academic master's and PhD in law and development here at FGV, professional master's and PhD students, law to science graduate program, and also foreign exchange students at FGV Sao Paulo Law School. Professor Alexander's course is on blockchain and new technologies in corporate and capital market law. Hi, Professor Alexander. Uh, so Hi. you're teaching a course here at uh, FGV Law School yes. on blockchain. How is it going? So how is the experience here teaching these students? So first and foremost, thank you for having me. I am always, you know, it's always great to come back to, to Brazil and to Sao Paulo. So, so that's, that's, that's really lovely. But also, you know, I wasn't necessarily expecting it, but the course is just great. You huh. know, the students are really, I was a little bit concerned, right, because it's a combination of students from undergrad and then master program, and there are also students from, you know, exchange students coming from different countries. So I was like, Phew, how do I, you know, create a course that is able to, to support all of these students who might have a different degree of knowledge or experience and so on. So at the beginning, it was a little bit of a, of a, of a challenge, but I think, I think it's going, you know, of course you need to ask the students, uh -huh. <laughs> but um, I'm enjoying it. I think that, um, you know, they have different perspectives. They, they see the world through maybe different lenses. And, and the great part, which, you know, is one of the things why I love being in academia is that, and educating, is that you always learn something new. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I definitely, we have this kind of different kinds of discussions, obviously, you know, what is happening in Brazil, what is happening in South America, what is happening in different parts of the world when it comes to blockchain and, and capital markets, right? And how we can change the way the infrastructure is designed in order to support the people rather than the mm -hmm. big, large banks mm -hmm. and other financial institutions. Mm -hmm. and, and the perspectives of, you know, um, what is happening in Brazil and, for instance, how, how innovative the, the Brazilian central bank is mm -hmm. were, were super, you know, new to me because I, uh -huh. I've never done a research focusing on Brazil per se, so, so yeah. But it's nice that you, as you're saying, you're actually bringing a lot of things to the table, uh, but also you're receiving a lot of, Correct. you know, in, information, knowledge from the students and from the various uh, perspectives and also, I think, uh, levels of career, you know, because some people oh, yes. are already working on this topic, some people yes. Want to know more about this topic, yes. so that's um, that's interesting. And you have been working uh, in this issue of law and technology generally, but also specifically with blockchain as well. And um, and it's sometimes there's a challenge of knowing what actually uh, what's the contribution that law schools can uh, provide to yes. this topic, right? Um, because sometimes I imagine that this um, area is very uh, dominated by you know economics, economists, and also you know finance people or whatnot, uh, even people that design technology. So, what do you think, in your perspective, is the contribution that legal schools such as FGV, but also uh, your uh, home school? Um, in uh, the University of Copenhagen can bring to the table of this in this area? 
That's a that's a great question, and I think you know over what is it now? Maybe five, seven, ten years. We've seen uh, a change and an improvement in the perspectives of where is the law and how law should, not just as a as a field, but also as an institution, educational institutions. What what, sh what we should do. And I remember, you know, years back before initiating the entire Copenhagen Legal Tech Lab and starting different courses on law and technology and, of course, on digital lawyer and, and legal tech lab and courses like this, including blockchain, um, I remember thinking, okay, how do I do this in a way that um, doesn't doesn't won't make the students afraid of the technology, right? Mm -hmm. Because often law students choose to study law because they don't like math, <laughs> right? Um, and this is this is a perspective that maybe is changing. I, I hope mm -hmm. it's changing, but but definitely it's a different way of thinking, right? The way how the technologies are designed, it's a very different think way of thinking. But over the years, I more and more came to conclusion that there are very many similarities, actually, mm -hmm. right? The way, let's say, and I, there's a field of law that currently is coming up, which is called computational law, mm. and how we cons uh, we construct different kinds of arguments and and we try to persuade other people and so on. And there are similarities, but kind of you know going back to the questions and say, so where is the 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 or what is the role mm -hmm. of the law schools? I think the role is extremely important from the perspective that we need to prepare law students to be able not just to provide legal services with technologies, but to provide legal services and advice for a world that is driven mm. by technologies. And what do I mean by that is that often we see different language, different yeah, different language between how lawyers communicate and how tech people communicate. Mm -hmm. And over the yeah the years, I think that an imp interesting part was like, how do we translate one to another? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that that the tech guy or girl who is designing, let's say, the next AI, actually considers that you know if you are going to feed them data from single country or single region or from particular town uh, or of a people of particular age, gender, sex, etc., etc., that this will be a very bad technology because it will not actually address... Probably bias or even... Exactly, enough, or, yeah. exactly, right? Um, so how do we translate it into a, a, a language, ultimately, mm -hmm. that they can understand? Mm -hmm. So I think that this is important and we see that this is important because we see how many different kinds of cases of misuse of technology are out there. Mm -hmm. um, but for lawyers to be able to address them, they need to also understand how the technology works. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that you know lawyers need to become the coders, mm -hmm. not at all. But they need to have conceptual understanding of how these technologies are built and what are the underlying levels of data and how do you collect data and so on and so forth. Yeah, as an uh, analogy, you could say that they don't need to speak fluently the language of technology, but at least they need to be able to translate and use that knowledge and that language to yes. talk with other people. Um, very interesting. And also, a final question is, um, you know, have been teaching in various institutions and also in various parts of the world. And um, what kind of uh, advice would you give to the young uh, lawyers and also students that are uh, try to thinking that law and technology is a field that they want to work on and study? So yes. what kind of uh, devices that maybe you use in your own experience, mm -hmm. in your journey to um, in this area? There are a couple of things. A, I do think there is a lot of resources out there. So I think that even if the students are studying in countries or institutions where which are more conservative, which law schools mm -hmm. historically have been, um, there is there are many resources that they can tap into. That's one. Two is obviously choose maybe some specialized program or the exchanges at mm -hmm. the universities where you can see that oh they are teaching these kind of courses mm -hmm. and just. Like get into, at FGV, yeah. like at but, here at yeah. FGV or in Copenhagen or mm -hmm. some other places, obviously around the world. Mm -hmm. um, but also, the the most important thing is not to be afraid of it. Mm 
mm-hmm. uh, from the perspective, even though you feel like, oh, but this is, you know, I don't understand the code, I, I can't code. Mm-hmm. You don't need to know how the code is, you know, you don't need to become the, a coder. Mm-hmm. The only thing you need to know that there is a certain binary logic and mm-hmm. that it's based on zeros and ones mm-hmm. and there is a very specific structure how things happen. But then once you get into this, you will understand that it's very similar also to the law, because mm-hmm. we know that, let's say, from criminal perspective, criminal law perspective, you know, that if this happened and this happened, mm-hmm. then this needs to happen, right? You also code a lot in law, you know, legal and illegal and, yes, and stuff like exactly. that. Yes, exactly. So it's, you know, it's more or less the world is somehow binary. Mm-hmm. And this is the challenge of the technology mm-hmm. that there is always, it's always binary. Right, and then it's probabilistic mm-hmm. statistics come mm-hmm. in, right? And I think that if we are not, and the students are not afraid to kind of learn a little bit about this, then you know. And they can even like challenge the binary and think of all the ways of think about law and technology, exactly. right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.